everybody this is ben powers with the commander's voice i'm joined today by mr james fenelon did i pronounce that correctly sir absolutely uh, james is the author of the book four hours of fury which is an outstanding book about the 17th airborne division and their role in operation varsity which is a jump across the rhine towards the end of world war ii so james welcome how are you today i'm doing very well thank you i appreciate the opportunity to be here very cool. I'd like to start out just talking about the book and your motivations for writing it. I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler here because I think this is the coolest thing ever. You're the only person I ever know who went looking for a book, couldn't find it, so they wrote it. That, that's kind yeah. of what I took away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when I, I went through jump school in 1988 and went to what the time was a pretty humble infantry museum there at Fort Benning, and they had a uh, a small display about the combat jumps in the European theater. And at the bottom of that list was Operation Varsity, the jump across the Rhine. And I had never really heard of that operation. Um, you know, going through airborne school at the time, it, it stuck with me as something I wanted to learn more about. I had heard about Normandy, of course, and, and the jumps into Italy and Sicily and, and Market Garden. And it just struck with me. I don't know if it's because varsity was easy to remember or what it was, but over the years, I just kept trying to get more information on that operation. And eventually, you know, after searching and only being able to find mentions of it in, in parts of other books and not being able to find anything really dedicated to the 17th Airborne Division, uh, to your point, I decided to address that myself by uh, writing a book about it. Very cool. And so, you alluded to the fact you first learned about when you were going through jump school in 88. So before we dig into the book a little bit more, could you tell us a little bit about your military career and time as a paratrooper? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's not a lot to tell. I, I feel, like, especially with what's been going on currently, I, I was in from 88 to, to 99. Most of that was in the reserve component. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to jump school, Pathfinder school and, and jump master school. So I spent a fair amount of time at Fort Benning. Um, and enjoyed enjoyed those experiences and the camaraderie that uh, I gained through that experience. And that was one of the elements that I kind of wanted to to capture in the book. You know, we kind of look at World War II veterans and, you know, they're in their 80s or their 90s. And it's hard to imagine them back as those 19 or 20 year old guys that, that we served with um, when we were in. And it was that kind of spirit that I wanted to capture as, as telling, this, telling the, their, their story. Very cool. So when did the idea, so you, you, you're a young man, you, you learned about Operation Varsity, you, you were looking around for it. About how long between like 88 and you, the time you decided, okay, I'm actually going to commit to writing this book. Like how, how long did that take to germinate in your brain? Uh, yeah, so it was probably in the early 2000s when I started to have a little bit more disposable income. I started collecting uh, personal accounts, you know, books that were written by veterans about their experiences in World War II. And it was, it was through that and reading a bunch of, of, of great books by veterans in the 82nd and then 101st. And again, I started looking for, you know, there was two other airborne divisions, the 11th and the 17th, and just was not finding a lot um, written by those guys. And so that was kind of where I started getting the idea. And I, I went there was a glider pilot reunion here uh, down, in, down in San Antonio that I went to and met a couple of glider pilots that had participated in the operation. And that was kind of the first um, idea I had around, well, maybe, you know, maybe I could take these, these interviews that I had with these guys and start to use that as a basis to tell, to tell the story. Oh, that's very cool. About how many uh, veterans, be they paratroopers, glider riders, or glider pilots, did you actually get an opportunity to meet and talk to? Because I realize they are getting up in age now. They're a very precious commodity. They are, yeah. I would say between um, 17th Airborne Vets, glider pilots, um, I interviewed a handful of Canadian paratroopers who, who jumped in as part of the, the 6th Airborne Division, a couple of British paratroopers. I would say all told, from and troop carrier pilots, I would say probably two dozen, two and a half dozen interviews all told. Oh, very cool. That's actually a pretty, pretty hefty number compared to what I was thinking it might be at this point in time. Yeah, well, you got to keep in mind, it was, it took me probably over 10 years to complete the project. So I was fortunate in that, and then I got started 
when uh, we had a lot more access to World War II veterans. Oh, very, very, very interesting. Now, one thing I really love about your book is because my pet peeve is when, I'm, especially when I'm reading military history, there's not a lot of maps, and you've got like 13 excellent maps illustrating from, hey, this is the the, the strategy that was going on at like you know army group level down to, hey, here's what was happening on individual drop zones. So. In the course of doing your research, did you were you able to have access to different primary documents? Did you hit archives, or were you relying on memories or secondary sources? How, what drove your research to be able to get that level of detail into the book? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's it's not a short answer. But um, first of all, I appreciate you saying that because I actually did all those maps myself. Oh wow! Um, I share your uh, affinity for for maps in military books. As we all know, terrain is a major component of of both tactics and strategy. And so I wanted to provide readers with with that information to help them understand the flow of how the battle occurred. Um, and the way I the way I tackled that level of detail was twofold. One, it was um, I had access to period maps that I found in the National Archives. And then I also had um, access to period after action reports that in a lot of, in a lot of cases had um, grid references um, in the after action reports. A lot of the unit, uh, the S1 or S2 journals that were in there, they had, now they had their grid coordinates encoded. So I had to go in the archives and find the encoding mechanism that they used so I could, I could reverse engineer the grid coordinates, but then it just became a simple question of then plotting them onto the period maps. And then I got another level of detail by, if I knew by way of example that, you know, Easy Company 513th Parachute Adventure Regiment was on this hill and I knew, and I had veterans accounts from being in that same company that I was able to kind of template over their experiences in the direction they moved to kind of add some additional detail in cases or to plot where specific points or, or rather specific events took place in relation to those locations. It was one of the funnest parts of the project was oh, it sounds awesome. pull, pulling that all together. Yeah. So, and I, I already know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. So with your background as a paratrooper and an infantryman, I'm assuming that really drove how you approach this project because it wasn't just from an academic perspective. And is that a correct assumption? Absolutely, I think, and that was one of the things that I wanted to to juxtapose, you know, so I got out as a as an E6. And, you know, these guys, as I look back at World War Two, you know, it, it's again, it, you know, you, well, well, I'm kind of bumbling, but one of the examples that kind of set this crystallized this for me was after I'd interviewed a couple of these veterans, I had uh, high res copies made of the Stars and Stripes from March 24th and sent them framed copies of it as thank yous for, for um, allowing me to interview them and you know, have access to their, their memories and, and some of their memorabilia. And four of the guys wrote me back and said that they had never knew where they were in Germany until they saw that map on the stars and stripes that I had sent them, <laughs> right? And so it just, it just really struck the difference to me in, in the difference between the guys whose boots are on the ground and the guys who are doing all the planning. Right. And so we look back at World War II and think, well, these guys knew where they do, you know, what they were doing, where they were going. They didn't, they didn't know any of that stuff. And so I wanted to really set up the structure um, in the narrative of the book between the guys who were jumping in and, and, and doing the fighting versus, you know, the, the senior staff guys, Ridgeway and, and Eisenhower, who were doing the planning and just show what a what a difference there was in who had the context of what was happening and, and who didn't. No, that's absolutely terrific. Because one of the one of the things I find myself as a reader falling into, you, you really just have that temptation to armchair quarterback when you're, you know, in the backyard on a sunny day and you kind of know what's going on. And even with experience, you kind of forget what it's like on an unfamiliar drop zone when you've been awake for 36 hours and you, you know, you're kind of stumbling around. Th things are are very different. So that's I right. I really appreciate that you brought that perspective to the book. So I've got two. The, that answer actually has driven two additional questions in my brain right now. The first one being, did you ever come across a situation where you either had material in the archives or feedback from a veteran in an interview where you just had diametrically opposed stories about what supposedly happened and what was ostensibly the same firefighter, the same situation? And if you did, how did you resolve that? Uh, great question. So I wouldn't say that I found anything that was diametrically opposed. I found some things that 
were unclear as by way of timeline or maybe where it took place. Um, one of those examples was there was, um, you know, where one of the Medal of Honor events took place. Um, I was able to, to kind of reassess the, the traditional narrative of where that event took place based on um, the fact that at the end result, there was some rescued B-24 pilots. And so there was some, you know, Sherlock Holmes work, if you will, around figuring out like, where that air crew was being held captive by the Germans, where uh, the parachute infantry regiment was, was moving towards where their objective was and where, where it occurred. And so I was able to actually build uh, a complementary narrative of pulling several stories together by identifying that they all actually took place in the same the same geographic area. Very, very cool. That, uh, I like the, the sleuthing involved in that. I think that's really interesting. The second thing which I learned about, which I thought was really neat, and I, I, until I read your accounts, I had never known that this was, had happened, was about the glider pilots once they hit the ground. You always hear about, okay, the, 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 dif the difficulty of landing the gliders and uh, you know they're breaking up and the wings are shearing off and all these terrible things, but you really took the time to kind of follow up on what these guys did and how they sort of formed into ad hoc platoons and they were pulling security missions. And was that something you found was, was that part of their training or was that something peculiar to varsity that had been learned over a series of operations that this is the best utilization of this manpower once we're on the ground? If you could expound a little bit more on the glider pilots experience after the glider landing, I'd really appreciate that. Sure. Yeah, I think it was kind of a combination of, of all of the above, right? So glider pilots, um, as part of their, their training, uh, you know, supplementing the obviously their, their flight training, did learn basic infantry skills. So they had gone, you know, stateside, they had gone through and learned how to fire a pistol, a bazooka, you know, light machine guns, things of that nature, because it was, it was projected that they would, you know, be landing on the battlefield and would need to know how to protect themselves. What wasn't really projected or wasn't really contemplated or organized up until varsity was actually putting them in cohesive units. So as you well know, you know, you, it, it's not until you actually start training together that you actually can perform any kind of rigorous task on the battlefield, right? And so up until, you know, in Normandy, these guys were largely on their own. They landed in Normandy. They kind of had to make their way back to the beaches to be evacuated. The idea was because they had such specialized skill sets, they weren't supposed to hang out in the battlefield very long. They were supposed to be evacuated quickly so that then as pilots, they could potentially fly in another echelon or be used for, for a follow-on mission. Um, in Market Garden, um, Gavin, James Gavin, the commander of the 82nd, you know, wrote a scathing after action report about how poorly organized and mismanaged the glider pilots were as part of Operation Market Garden through really no fault of their own. They just weren't really, you know, the, the, the airborne units didn't have anything to do with them because they only participated in airborne operations on actual operations. The troop carrier units didn't really um, go out of their way to help the glider pilots because a lot of times they would move from unit to unit depending on what the, the carrying mission of the particular aviation unit was responsible for. And so um, when Varsity came along was the first time that they actually started to organize these guys into composite platoons and companies. And the 17th Airborne Division sent a couple of guys, some infantry officers and enlisted um, from the 194th Glider Infantry to uh, the glider pilots and put them through an intensive basic training, if you will, to kind of get their skills back up to speed and to get them working with each other in these assigned um, temporary units so that when they landed in, in Germany, they, they can perform as a unit. No, oh, very cool. That's actually really, really interesting. It, when you had the opportunity to talk to the Canadian and the airborne, per, uh, Canadian and British, excuse me, the Canadian British airborne personnel, did anything come out about the differences in how they have, they have been trained or differences in their doctrine uh, compared to what American troopers had been trained and prepared to do? Or were there more similarities than differences? I think there were a lot of similarities. Um, one of the, I will say that one of the American 17th Airborne Division veterans that I spoke to, they had done some joint training with the British uh, paratroopers, which at that point, in relation to the 17th anyway, had a lot more combat experience. And he was highly complimentary of the joint training that they had done together and said that, the, that he, he and his fellow guys in the, in the 513th had really gotten a lot out of that training. 
No, very cool. Very cool. So transitioning a little bit from the discussion about the book to discussion about your own development as an author, had you, this is your first published book, if I'm not mistaken, correct? That's right. So do you now, have you kind of considered yourself, I'm a, I'm a guy who had an interest who published a book or really like, okay, I think I, I think I'm an author now. It, like how, how, how does that development take place? It, yeah. It, well, I think it's probably somewhere, somewhere in between. I mean, I definitely still have my mission of wanting to tell more um, unknown airborne stories from World War II. You know, there's just so many great um, examples of, of these guys kind of, forming the traditions that, that the Airborne still consider sacred today. And so that's, that's kind of my, my mission as an author, um, as it currently stands, is to find more of those missions like the 17th Airborne, uh, maybe the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment jumped on the Corregidor. You know, there's, this, there's still a lot more to explore um, in that regard. No, oh, that's awesome. That's very exciting. Now, I noticed you have an excellent man cave back there, an excellent study. Now, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm looking over your right shoulder right now. What, what, that uniform in the corner there, is that a 17th Airborne Division memento? It is. That is a uh, Ike jacket from a member of the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment when they were assigned to the 17th Airborne Division. Now, and that's an, I'm very excited that was a 507th because I want, that's an excellent segue. Do you, one thing I noticed in the book was you've got the 507th, they participated in the Normandy invasion. They've got a very experienced commander in this guy, Edson Raff, who is a 509th commander, as well as the 507th. He's like, you know, Mr. Airborne. And then you look at, this is the first combat jump the rest of the division's making. Uh, they had co some combat experience from the Battle of the Bulge, but they had been committed as ground troops there. W would you say that the 507th was a cohesive element that the division was able to be built around and were a stabilizing element or do you feel that the 507th was more of a because they were sort of a late addition rather than came, came over them stateside that they were just another example of the the 507th being attached to a, another element for a combat operation much like they'd been attached to the 82nd from Normandy was that a positive or was it a negative um, I think their addition to the division was definitely a positive. They were they were attached to the 17th right before the Battle of the Bulge, so they did participate with the division in the Battle of the Bulge, and then of course they spearheaded the jump into Varsity. Um, it's interesting to kind of look look at their experience and try to understand what influence or what impact they might have had on the division as a wider as a wider body. You know. Uh, a lot of people didn't like Edson Raff. Um, he was, uh, he had a very particular way of leading and he enjoyed um, needling other officers outside of the regiment. He loved to remind everybody on the 17th Airborne staff that they hadn't gone to combat, they didn't have a combat jump. Um, when he was commander of the 509th, he actually led America's first airborne operation into North Africa. So he had an impressive resume. You know, one of the things though that I would say it's a good, interesting lesson learned that he had taken through his experiences was that when they, when they were preparing for the jump into Germany, he made sure that his, his NCOs and all his guys jumped with their, with their radios and their heavy equipment, um, which, the other, which the other regiment in the 17th did not do. And so, you know, as, as, it, as, it, as it turns out, there was, you know, scattered drops, one battalion landed in the wrong area but because the 507th had their radios with them and were able to put them into service quickly, they were actually able to um, adjust to the situation, reassign uh, objectives to where units had landed as opposed to where they were supposed to go. And the 507th seized their objectives before any of the other regiments in the division did on, in, in Varsity. Oh, that's an outstanding anecdote, especially when you look at the fact, I mean, comms really does make the commander. So I think that that is a very, very fine example of that. The, the thing I took away from your treatment of RAF, which I really uh, appreciated, was that he was probably a very difficult subordinate and peer, but he would be, he's the guy that you want to serve under. He's going to make sure that you've got what you need. He, he might not give a great back brief to the, to the CG, but he's going to make sure that the op board you get to do your own planning as a subordinate leader is going to be detailed and provide you the information. He was very focused on the success of his subordinates. At least the, the way you portray him as an officer, that's what I took away. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think a lot of, you know, a lot of guys that I, who I either interviewed with or uh, found letters from later, I, 
you know, Raph was one of those guys that at the time wasn't very popular because he was really big into PT. Um, he himself didn't drink. So he didn't have a lot of sympathy for guys who, who did go drink. Um, and so he was, he was a divisive character up until after they all went to combat together. Right. And so it was like a lot of guys in hindsight kind of then understood what he was trying to do and understood the method to his madness, if you will. And a lot of guys changed their opinions of his value as their commander after they went into combat for the first time. Interesting. Now, two, two more questions. because I'm coming to the end of my time here. The one, one question is a question I've had since I was like 16 years old and I read Ridgeway's Paratroopers. When you're talking about the commanding general of the 17th Airborne Division, is it Bud Milley or Bud Miley? How do you pronounce that guy's name? Uh, Miley. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So General Miley, what, what is your opinion of him when you compare him to the more well-known uh, airborne commanders? Was, is he a Ridgeway? Is he a Gavin? Is he at that level? A lot of people really don't know too much about him, even though he was – a paratroopers paratrooper way back with the provisional airborne group at the beginning of the war even yeah that's right i mean i think you know as paratroopers we we owe him uh an amazing debt and his family uh his son was actually serving in the 11th airborne division in world war ii while he was commander of the 17th airborne division so it's, he's, he's got quite a quite a legacy you know, it, it's it's an interesting one to try to pin him down. I, you know, I think that he's uh, he's made outstanding contributions. Um, a lot of the stuff, you know, the airborne wings, the jump boots, all that stuff originated with Miley. Um, is he is he a Gavin or is he a Ridgeway? I would definitely put him up there in that crew. You know, a lot of his a lot of his troopers say, well, you know. Uh, Gavin always had a press agent wherever he went. And <laughs> Miley, Miley didn't. Miley didn't like the press, and and that's why we didn't get as much, uh, you know, notoriety as 82nd. Obviously, 82nd went through the entire war, so uh, sure. they deserve every bit of publicity that they that they got for those for those events. And I think, you know, the 17th kind of came in late, started with the Battle of the Bulge, and then went into Varsity, and then not long after Varsity, the war, the war was over. And then the 17th was disbanded. And so their legacy is kind of in that short period of time there. And I think, you know, they deserve more credit than they got. That's for sure. Well, you certainly gave them that credit in your book. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it to anybody who is uh, interested in airborne history, which is audience, obviously a big part of our audience here. So again, James's book is called Four Hours of Fury by Mr. James M. Fenelon. I got my copy at the local Barnes and Noble. I'm sure you can get it online at Amazon. Is there any other place you'd want people to uh, purchase it from, James? Is there a particular website or uh, location that you think would be, you know, better for folks to get or just any local bookstore? I think local bookstores or Amazon, any of the above is great. All right, terrific. Well, thank you very much for joining us. This is uh, Ben Powers. You've been with us on the Commander's Voice. And I just want to say thank you to James for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here. All right, have a great night, sir.